It's Greg Berger. And me, Ripto. Hey, you brought a dragon to Avalar? I hate dragons. And of course, Hunter was uh, always happy to give you uh, prompts and clues, but a lot of what he did was uh, expositional, if you think about it, getting you from point A to point B, and telling you which buttons to push and which triangles to hit, etc., etc., etc. So Hunter uh, actually fulfilled two functions as kind of a player guide, but also uh, as Hunter, for God's sake, helping you get through the adventure. I have only the happiest memories of Spyro. It goes all the way back. And when they called me back for the Reignited Trilogy, hey, that was so much icing on a beautiful cake that I just uh, put my heart and soul and tonsils back into it. And uh, that's the joy of doing it. That's the joy of doing all of it. Before Enter the Dragonfly, Insomniac said their goodbyes to Spyro with Year of the Dragon. This final Insomniac title cemented the trilogy into one of the most iconic game franchises in history. But, as it turns out, the inner development story of the title has never been entirely known. Beginning in November of 1999 and wrapping up in mid-September of 2000, Year of the Dragon had a total of ten and a half months of development. The entire process went smoothly for the most part, but certainly had some bumps on the road, as most games encounter during their production. Now, let's begin by talking with the well-known and loved Brian Algaia, who still works at Insomniac to this day. He listed all the levels he designed on the project to us, which includes Bamboo Terrace. This level actually turns out to be the first level that was worked on for the game. Exclusively, Brian later provided info of a design change to Fireworks Factory, particularly in the Agent 9 minigame. He recalled that originally the ninjas took three hit points to kill, but this was changed to one in the final instead, as they tripled the number of enemies. This not only made the challenge faster and more engaging, but the insane number of enemies in this area was actually quite impressive for the time. We also learned the internal names for how the levels functioned from Brian, as well as some early level names on top of the ones already known such as Cloud City for Cloud Spires and Dry Gulch for Dino Mines. James Justin was a pretty important programmer on the title. He actually helped a bunch of key features get into the game single-handedly. James even informed us that the Sheila side-scroller minigame and Sparks levels were on the list to be cut if Insomniac didn't find a programmer to get them functional. He also stated that Sunrise Spring and its respective levels were the ones that received high priority in the last month, which is where tons of bugs were hammered out of existence. This was done to ensure the game received fantastic reviews from the press, and to give the part of the game that most people would play the best experience possible. Mini games and side areas were even allowed to have a handful of bugs if the main game was polished as could be. Evidently, every hub world contains a mini boss such as Bluto in Seashell Shore. However, when it came time for Midnight Mountain's mini boss to be implemented, development time had run out. Dino Mines features an extra portal leading to an unused area many have been aware of. This area is exactly where the fourth and final mini-boss would have taken place. From what we can tell, some type of large dinosaur would have fired projectiles towards Spyro, and the structure of the battle would have been very similar to Sleepyhead in Spooky Swamp. A high-profile Universal employee named Mike Gollum worked on the entirety of the original Crash and Spyro trilogies in the sound department. In fact, he created hundreds of Spyro's sound effects with his voice alone, so let's look at a call we held with him. I was at Universal Studios at that time. We'd work together and just develop stuff, you know, we'd use our sound libraries, we'd record sounds, we'd record our voices as sounds, like all the quirks and stuff where it was all just us making sounds out of our own mouths. It's pretty kind of, it was really a lot of fun. Me and Chris and other people, we would get in there to make sounds. You know, we kind of all wanted to sound like it was sort of a family of, of creatures, so there's a similarity to all of them. You do the in-game sounds, so the sounds that are triggered by the action as you're playing, and then there's little interstitials or little cutscenes that they have too that you do sounds for. And I look back at those a while ago and they're just so primitive. There's hardly any sounds in it because there's really not a lot going on in those videos. They are what they are. It was early days of gaming. I worked on all of them. It was just an interesting period in, in gaming, you know, it was early on and we were working on Crash Bandicoot at this you know, practically the same time and there was just a lot of learning happening from the people making the games, from the people making the sounds. It was all uh, kind of a work in progress, you know. None of it had been figured out. 
So it was quite an interesting time to be at such a formative stage in the game industry. And I didn't know it at the time, but working on games that were going to become classic games, right? You don't know that when you're working on it, it's just a game. And then it turns out that these were games being made by super talented, super smart people. I did all the sounds from Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> no, it was mostly me, but there was there were some people at the on the on the Crash Bandicoot dev team side. And there were other people at Universal Studios who I worked with, but I was mostly mostly in charge of that one. Everybody seems to love the Aku Aku. I was actually one of the guys that I worked with. He had a deeper voice than me, so he did that one. It was Andy Dawson. But then you know the box sound I love. And the, there was like a fruit chomp sound, I think, or a gulp sound. <laughs> I used my voice for a lot of that stuff, so it's really cool. And you go through many, many iterations sometimes to get the right one. Sometimes they change the animation or they change the speed or something, so you have to change the sound. And you're constantly, it's constantly evolving until it's released. The biggest thing about that was just trying to find a sound that would be, convey the right feel while still being super, super small. You know, they're kilobytes, they're, they're, they're no megabyte sounds, they're tiny little sounds. Every bit of it was a challenge. Getting the video, the, the images to be there, getting the music there, the sound, and it's constantly a battle. Sound usually is sort of not at the top of that list, right? <laughs> Something you're gonna see gets priority for sure. And music, when it's made by Stuart Copeland, is gonna get priority for sure. The fighting for room, you know, to put your sounds was key. And it was constantly a, a battle to get that, get your sounds in there. That wasn't only on Spyro, that was on all of these. Ah, oh, gosh, you have to look at my credit list. God of War, Jade Empire, uh, Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, Uncharted. I stayed working with Naughty Dog and Zombieland for a long, long time, as if they were one of my clients for many years. And then we worked with other Sony Studios, that's where we did God of War. And we worked on some stuff for Konami. And, uh, I don't even remember. As the business grew, I kind of grew into a higher role, but our team ended up working on other games for like Bungie and just all kinds of stuff. Dozens and dozens of games. I would say it was a, it was a, it was a good experience, yeah. Fun is a game development is super hard. So as much as it's fun to play the games, it's much harder than it to build a game. So they'd send us video, we'd make sounds to that video, we'd send them audio files, and then implement those audio files in the game, and then they'd play it, See how, how it worked. We get built of the game. Well, it was really to play it. We'll see what we got. Uh, I saw a little bit of it. Yeah, I actually, actually sent some sounds to the company. They asked me for some of the old sounds that I had some of the stuff. So I set up some, some of the sounds that I had. They were inspired by them. I think. I think the crash ones I had specifically. Spyro. I don't think Spyro asked for. Them. Concept art was created for the Spyro trilogy by a few people, expanding in numbers with each preceding title. Most designs are extremely faithful in translating from 2D to 3D thanks to Oliver Wade being responsible for most of the concept art, models and animations. Although, some interesting differences are present in the concept art, with some being substantially different from their final in-game appearance. Speaking of Oliver Wade, he also answers some questions for us that have been unknown for years. On one note, he told us that for Ripto's Rage, Elora was originally going to have four legs and be more of a centaur creature. Elora was designed after actress Victoria Kelher and named after insomniac level designer Caroline. Just scramble up the letters of Caroline and you'll get Elora. 
He also told us that he really wanted Sergeant Bird to be a pig with a jetpack, but it was overruled by the higher-ups at Insomniac, probably for the better. Additionally, he spoke about how the design process for all the Spyro characters went. He recalled that they were designed in roughly five minutes apiece, with most of them only having one design rendition. Rarely were character designs rejected or tweaked, if ever, just because of the time constraints that Year of the Dragon had. Two characters, labelled as Amish Dolphin Rider and Random Dragon, were two cut ideas from Spyro 2 and 3. Aquaria Towers originally had a whole gang of Amish characters, with each having a unique occupation. But since Oliver found this concept to be too weird even for Spyro standards, it was replaced with seahorses and crabs. However, perhaps even more of note is the dragon. It would have been a secondary NPC within Bamboo Terrace, according to Wade, which means the entire concept for it was removed, probably meaning the dragon would have been a one-off character in a minigame, similar to Jack from Charmed Ridge. Throughout each of the homeworlds in the game, unused dialogue can be uncovered, ranging from an entirely cut professor interaction in Evening Lake to altered demo dialogue coming from Hunter. Even the Enchanted Towers NPCs have very different original dialogue that needs to be toned down. Thanks for freeing me! Why don't you come and visit me in my homeworld? If you can charge Toad Boy into the lava, I think I can finish him off. This is the most fun I've had since we chased King Flippy on the Manta Ray! Now that you've mastered the basics, let's see you do some stunts! Try using the X or Triangle button to jump off ramps and turn in the air! Not too bad, eh? <laughs> Very post-Neolithic, wouldn't you say? And now, for my latest experiment, Blast Sculpting! I shall attempt to carve an image of you with a single explosive detonation. Thank you for offering to help, Spyro, but surely even you wouldn't be able to defeat all those Rhinox until the power-up is active. Thanks for freeing me. Why don't you come visit me in my home world? If you charge into the lava boulders after I drop them, they'll explode against anything they hit. Whenever you get low on health, just toast a chicken or two, and you'll soon be ship -shape. Oh dear, oh dear. I've been trying to build a rocket to take you to Midnight Mountain, but I appear to have misplaced my plans. Now I can't even remember where I was working. Don't worry about me, I'm just gathering my thoughts. Uh, let's see, I was working on the plans, some ninjas appeared, uh, yes, and then everything gets fuzzy. Thanks for freeing me. Why don't you come visit me in my home world? In December of 2019, an interesting press kit for Year of the Dragon popped up. While it's not as spectacular as the original game's kit, this one contains some interestingly exclusive content such as a pair of Sparrow chopsticks, and also some press documents. For those who may not be aware, press kits and discs are given out before a game's release and typically contain art renders, screenshots, and even early gameplay videos. For example, art used in Sparrow 1's manual can be found in pure HD quality in the game's press kit. When the game originally released, a handful of music tracks weren't present. This was later fixed in the Greatest Hits version, which not only added the extra music, but it fixed some of the major glitches found in the original version. Even the Speedways had a glaring issue with collecting the eggs. If the player didn't 100% the level on the first try, collecting the leftover eggs became impossible. But the reason why certain tracks were missing is quite simple. A bug caused Evening Lakes track, for example, to play Sunrise Springs instead. It was an issue with the placement of music track values in the files, but eight other tracks were not implemented in the original release due to time constraints. After all, music is composed towards the latter half of development for the most part, so the fact that Midnight Mountain's levels lack their respective themes in version 1.0 makes complete sense. Additionally, the power release received an updated version fixing major bugs but did not include the Greatest Hits content. A fair amount of early pre-release clips have survived the test of time, but that's not to say some haven't been lost due to non-existent preservation. With that in mind, tons and tons of changes, big and small, can be uncovered by analysing the clip. Various egg models as well as textures were swapped around throughout development. It's pretty crazy how Insomniac couldn't settle on one specific look for the dragon eggs. They went from being dark purple, then later appearing as green within the heads up display, as well as releasing the same golden fragments which remain unused in the final game, hmm, to finally settling on their final design. 
Getting a phone call with Insomniac's first official employee, Craig Stitt, was a goal we certainly had and accomplished. He was not only an artist on the entire Spyro trilogy, but he was the sole reason Spyro the Dragon even exists in the first place. Of all the games I've worked on, Spyro is the one that's near and dear to my heart. Ted Price, the president, CEO, owner, whatever you want to call it. He goes, everyone just go off into your corners for, I can't remember how long it was, two or three weeks, just break something, and come back, and we'll all pitch an idea, and then we'll pick, and then that's the game, next game Insomniac would do. So I think Ted came back with the Alien Invasion game. But Alex Hastings, the lead programmer, came back with an off-road racing game. I can't remember what Brian came back with. And I came back with the idea of doing a game where you, you get to play the dragon. Most games were you were fighting the dragon, or maybe you were riding a dragon, but you never got to be the dragon. The original game I pitched, it was it targeted a little bit older audience. Um, it was going to be a little more realistic um, game or look, and you would start out as a hatchling, as a baby dragon. But each level you would you'd be an older, larger dragon, more powerful dragon. But each, each level you would um, become a bigger more powerful dragon so by the end you'd be this huge gargantuan dragon magic using power uber powerful dragon and mark cerny who was our producer made two suggestions one if you keep the dragon the same age sequels would be easier and which was a good point and he pointed out also that by the time we had this game done and on the shelves the average age of the PlayStation user would be a couple years younger. So instead of targeting like, you know, the 17 to 20 years old, if we targeted like 12 to 15 year olds, nobody liked my little dragon I designed, which is just as well because we brought in another guy, um, Charles Zimbalist, who actually did the actual character design for Spyro. Gone Disruptor and Somniac's first game. They spent $10,000 or something like that for the ad, the entire ad campaign, which is basically a couple of print ads for a month or two. Sony picked up Spyro and they spent, I think, $10 million on advertising or something ridiculous like that. My primary job was physically building and texturing the world you ran around in. Although I didn't design Spyro or build the model for him, I actually did do the textures for Spyro. It's just a little rounder. The, uh, the Zimbalus is, was, was just is, is leaner and, 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 and sleeker looking. Um, and I, I agree his design is better than mine. I'm glad we went with his. It just would have been nice to have had it in mind. <laughs> All the other games I worked on, had I not been there, there would have been another artist I'd done the artwork. In the case of Spyro, if I hadn't been there, there would be no Spyro the Dragon. I've always loved dragons. To me, they are just the greatest creature. I mean, it's the combination of a Tyrannosaurus Rex with, with wings and breathes fire. I mean, you, you've got the best of everything in a dragon. And immediately everybody said, yeah, that's it. Because dragons can fly, they can run, they can flame, they can jump, they can do anything. And they're cool. Spyro, from the initial design, was supposed to be able to swim. Now, we didn't have any big swimming challenges in Spyro 1, but we did have some, some water obstacles and some hidden rooms that you were supposed to swim out to and get to. And then as we got really, you know, as we got towards the end, we realized that um, Alex, the programmer, was, he wasn't going to have time to program swimming. And so we all of a sudden had to come up with but we already had most of the worlds built with, with, with water that, you know, your spiral was supposed to be able to swim in. So all of a sudden we had to come up with a way to make this water dangerous, but not dangerous. So it was this kind of kludgy thing where you could swim for a little while and then make a shark eat you or something like that. The skies in Spyro were a, a new technique that uh, Peter Hastings came up with to try and save memory. He actually built the, the skies out of this, out of polygons. Each vertex, each point had a color value. And so um, I remember Ted Price did the first one and then he, he asked me if I could try one and then everyone really liked mine. So I kind of, at first I thought I got stuck doing the skies because they were a pain in the butt to do. Um, 
eventually they uh, the tools got a little better to build them, and then it got to be really fun. So then I started having I really enjoyed doing this guy. So I ended up doing all the skies for all three Spyros. Um, but the worlds, I, I typically did about a third of the worlds for each of the three games. In two, I think almost all the home worlds were mine. For, I know I did Buzz's Dungeon. I guess that's the boss round. And I may have done some of the Sparks mini rounds. I think I did Ice Peak. Giant Tower, definitely. I definitely remember that one. Maybe Sergeant Bird's base. Well, Lost Fleet, I, I definitely remember doing Lost Fleet. In that mountain. I went on vacation before we actually shipped the game. Because at that point we were like on lockdown, we didn't make the changes unless we really had to, and so like, it was no big deal for me to leave. And I take vacation a little earlier than usual. Yeah, so I came back and went to play it, and I was pissed. <laughs> the worst part is they didn't, they took the whirlwind out, they didn't take the island out. We were in the final, final version of the game. I'm not sure, Brian Hastings, um, one of the lead programmers, is the one that pulled that. And I'm not sure why, because it was working. Because when I left, the game was all but finished with some final polish and debugging. Viscerally remembered which areas I had worked on, because you would go, you'd run into a room or climb up on something or go past something, and I can remember having a certain set of textures that were just really problematic, or a certain build, or a certain uh, geometry that just didn't want to work originally. No, this was sort of in Spiral 1. It was one of the Magic Crafter rooms. There was a cave. And I remember just the text, trying to get a texture in there for the rock pattern that didn't look like wallpaper. So you couldn't see the repetit repetitiveness stamp in the, in the textures. And so he's running through this room and I just remember it's like, oh yeah, this texture took forever to get right. In Spyro 2, Summer Forest, there was this very complicated spiral staircase that went up to some somewhere, and I worked and worked and worked, and just could not, you know, finally got the staircase to work. But this, the geometry on spiral staircases is very tricky, and even in the real world, it's tricky. And then it was doubly so, given that the program, you know, spiral had to be able to run up it kind of automatically, not, yeah. And then had it finally had it work, and then it got cut. And looked, you know, then the designers decided to not have that and pour it out. Visually, it made that little part of the garden very cluttered, so I was glad to see it go. It just kind of sucked that, you know, I spent all the time to get it to work. I think it was just a little spiral staircase that went up to something. I think it was kind of back behind where you start. There's a couple spots where you can see my son's name, which is Brian, spelled with a Y, carved in this curly letters. And then the funny thing there was, um, Oliver came up to me and he goes, hey, um, my son's name is Brian, and it's spelled with a Y. But I also have a daughter named Brenda. You know, I don't want to tell my son that his name's carved in there. If you know, if my daughter's name, so could you put Brenda someplace? And so that that was towards the end. So he actually, there, it says Brenda Winter Tundra. I think in the door, top of the door, it says Brenda. That one's not so elaborate. I literally just kind of wrote Brenda at the top. This is a pretty well-known little Easter egg, is there was a guy named Dan, was one of our animators. And somehow, he kind of ended up as the mascot for Insomniac. And at somewhere way back when somebody stole his driver's license, scanned in the, the photograph, and so there's Dan's face is hidden all over in the Spyro games. It really was kind of the mascot for the company. That was a nightmare level um, to build because it had to be very precise because everything had to be lined up just right with the ramps and, and then the sky. That was a fun sky. I think that was one of the first times I really tried to do more than just clouds in the sky because that one actually has like trees distance and once again it's not painted it's not a texture it's this strange little system of building stuff out of polygons skelos headlands that's one of my favorite levels i've also got a thing for bones and skeletons and so that was just you got you know so i love dragons and i love bones and so that one is skeletons and dragons so it was like the perfect level the, the level designers they literally just it was literally just curves and 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 blocky shapes on a map um, 
and, di and, and dimensions. The first ones are the maps were originally just drawn on graph paper and by hand. They, they really were just blocky shapes. And sometimes the dimensions of the room were very critical and widths, widths of paths and hallways. The big one was elevation of different floors and platforms was all very critical. But what those platforms were and what the world looked like was completely left to the artists. The spiral was originally green. I got the videotape and we realized two things. One, most of the time he's going to be running around on grass. So it's going to be a little hard to see. And two is there was two or three other platforming games with green characters. There was Gex, the Gecko, there was Croc, the Crocodile. I, we sat, I sat down and did like, I don't know, eight or ten different colors of Spyro and just did these short little bursts of a video and recorded it and we all, we just sat down and we, you know, we just all watched it and picked the one we liked, yet it, it's, it hasn't aged well. But it's really cool to watch it because he, he, he looked really good black, but you lost all the details. He looked really good, this dark kind of brick red, just visually, just sat there and just tweaked the colors until I got them to where I liked them. At the time, we were working with Universal Studios, and they were our publisher. Universal was very difficult to work with. And so we wanted to get away from Universal, but if we left Universal, Universal owned the property rights to Spyro. So if we left Universal, we had to leave Spyro with Universal. It'd been up to me because I really didn't, didn't want to leave Spyro. <laughs> Probably would have stayed, but it's definitely a good thing we left. So we had no intention to have his name be Pete, but by the time we got to where we needed a real name, We've been calling him Pete for a year, a year and a half. <laughs> One of the early ideas that we liked, or some of us liked, was Pyro the Dragon. But we thought that was a little too on the nose and um, had too much you know, negative you know, pyromaniac connotation. And Brian Hastings um, pitched Spyro, and no one liked it. And a few months later, someone at Sony pitched Spyro, and everyone went, yes! And so whoever is it got the Sony got the credit. Brian was like, hey, Pete, I've actually got a shirt around here that says Pete. We, we had our names, you know, put on the pockets, and I had Pete put on mine just because. As of yet, I've never seen anybody comment on. It's something that drove me nuts, and I'm angry at myself for having screwed up on it. If you go back to the original Textures for Spyro himself, his wings. If you picture a bat wing or a dragon wing, it's kind of this, you know, it, you know, in peak, you know, inverted V shape, and then there's the little spine, the little bony structure that comes down. That's um, literally on a bat's wing. It's, it's the wings on a bat are literally its fingers. Um, they're just really long, skinny fingers with tissue strung between them. But the way I drew it, it's basically those those little the, the little struts. I have in the wrong places. There, there's yeah. It's hard to explain it visually, but it drove me nuts because it wasn't until after I'm playing the game, <laughs> I'm like, oh crap, those wings. It's, it's literally it's literally the same exact te texture. It's just applied slightly different to the polygon. It's just where those little struts come out of the, the main arm of the wing are were wrong. A select few unused textures even exist, some being early demo versions or entirely cut ideas in the final game. This includes removed doors and strange golden egg fragments. Some models actually go completely unused, such as an odd looking egg and even a cut enemy. During the cutscene entitled Hunter's Tussle, at the far left edge of the screen a peculiar model can be seen with a brief animation. In actuality, this is a cut enemy from Spyro 2 known as Mr. Fistus, which can also be seen in Spyro 2's Faunus Mortis. This character was not only brought back in Year of the Dragon for this cameo, but the enemy is even seen being referenced in Ratchet & Clank 3's Insomniac Museum. 
Oliver Wade recalls designing, modelling and animating Mr. Fistus on Ripto's Rage and even what level he would have been in. Mr. Fistus would have been an enemy in Cloud Temples as he would have started out as a statue and then broken free much like the other enemies. Although, his hand would have remained in stone form which is how he would have attacked Spyro by hammering down at the ground with his large stone fist. So that mystery has now been solved. Fans have picked up on the fact that before each boss in Year of the Dragon a charming cutscene plays. However, there's no cutscene before the final battle with the sorceress. You'd think that this cutscene would be one of the most important in the game, but unfortunately, no cutscene seems to have ever been planned for the sorceress, possibly due to time constraints. After all, the huge level count Year of the Dragon possessed exceeded Ripto's rage by a far margin. Jeff Seitz was credited as engineering and co-producing a good handful of the first batch of songs created for the Spyro trilogy. He's even worked with Stuart Copeland well before and after Spyro to this day. You could say he helped create the tone and feel of music that has become a staple for Spyro. Being brought on Ripto's Rage by Mike Gollum and continuing for Year of the Dragon, Brian Watkins recorded voice actors such as Tom Kenny and Pamela Hayden. He even created some iconic sound effects for the titles. Thankfully, his memory of this work for the game is as fresh as ever. Here's a fantastic phone call with Brian that offers a unique perspective to a role that never gets much appreciation. Initially, I was hired just to record the voiceover, and it was actually pretty much the first time that Warner Brothers had worked on a video game, thanks to Mike Gollum. He came to me, I was the ADR mixer, on what they called ADR Stage 2 in those days. And it was actually in a scoring stage, and it just had a series of mobos put in the corner. The actual ADR booth, or where the equipment was, where I was, was actually the drum booth for the scoring stage. I was on that stage, and that's where we started recording the characters for Spyro. Let's be seeing one dragon. Have you seen any giant chickens around here? Who wrote this? But then after we recorded the voice, Mike came to me later on. He knew I was doing game sound design. He asked me if I wanted to help create sound effects for the game. And so I did that for a few days. Not, not much. The most memorable sound I remember making was the bellow. That went up and down and I made the sound for that. And, and then a myriad of other sounds that I can't remember. I just remember having fun making something for that bellow. I think I did some kind of reward sounds where, you know, I use like sounds of a cash register closing. I vaguely remember making reward sounds. The reason why I remember Spyro just is just because it was the first game that I ever recorded voiceover for. Also, the, one of the founders of Insomniac was on the stage almost every day, and his name was Brian. And I did remember working with the girl with the Simpsons voice, because I, I was so blown away by her and, and her talent. And at the time, she was pretty darn cute. She was young, and I remember, I, I was married at the time, but I remember going, dang, wish I was single. When I worked on it, I actually had to go into Mike's room and work in Mike's room along with Jackie Ivanichik. Now, I got a really funny story for you. Mike's goal was to make a sound every 60 seconds. You had 60 seconds to make a sound. And he felt that you should be able to make 50 to 60 sounds per hour. And that was the goal. So what happened was I was sitting with Jackie and one of the sounds on the list was the bellow. And so we loaded that animation into Pro Tools and I played it and I was like, wow, this is this is a really cool thing. Like, can we take like five minutes and work on this thing? And she was like, take as long as you want. This is really important to Brian. And Mike walked in, he heard it and it sounded really complicated, right? It was a more complicated sound than what was mostly being produced for the game. And Mike was like, how long did that take you to do? And Jackie said, I think it took us 10 minutes. He goes, that's too long. That's too long. What I did is on that bellow was I think we made it a loop. Because didn't it just go up and down all the time? It never stopped. I think I made a loop sound that lasted maybe a second and a half or two seconds. 
And, you know, to Mike, I spent way too much time on it because I spent five minutes on it. Today, uh, a sound like that, I'd probably spend like, you know, 30 minutes on to make it perfection. You would probably make a beginning, a middle, an end, and you would probably have variations on it because, you know, the, they would want it to evolve. So if the player came back to it or went to another one, it's, it would sound slightly different. And that's just the difference in games now. We have more space. Believe me, there wasn't a lot of thought put towards it because you didn't have time to put a lot of thought towards it. You just had to go really fast. I remember thinking, God, you know, this could really use another couple minutes. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to sound. I'd like, I'd like to think that's part of the reason why I'm successful is that, you know, I, I want to make sure that things sound interesting or powerful or, you know, have layers that, that players glom onto and feel connected to that, whatever they're doing or using in a game. I always find that so satisfying. In the last Call of Duty game, Modern Warfare, um, I did all the reload sounds for the weapons. That was one of the things that, you know, people commented on. I remember recording uh, in the summertime for two, and then I remember recording again in the winter time for three. Now, I may not have done all of three, and I may not have done all of two, but I remember specifically doing Pamela Hayden. I mean, we've recorded dialogue as early as three years before the release date. Oh, he was so nice. He, he came in, and we started talking. I didn't realize who he was. I, I don't, I'm not a big animation buff, you know? And so he started making voices and I re recognized it right away because at the time I had a, a three and a four year old. And so, you know, we watched SpongeBob religiously and I go, oh, my God, I go, you're SpongeBob. And he goes, yeah. And I go, oh, my God, my kids and I, we watched that show over and over and, you know, and he started you know, doing all those voices. I can't tell you what a nice guy he is. I, I just, you know, it, some some actors can have like an attitude or, you know, be a little bit off-putting or maybe just, you know, don't really want you in their space. And Tom just like, he just totally embraced me and, and it was, I just loved him. I thought he was just a wonderful, wonderful human being. Universal Vivendi was not known for being very good at producing games. They relied heavily on on hiring, you know, outside developers and not really putting a hand on it, you know, just really watching production and, and the money. And so they didn't they didn't really want to be involved in, in in creative decisions. So obviously that one, they didn't like where it was going, and they just said, just remake Spyro, the third Spyro. You know, the thing is, though, is that at, by this time, game development has gone so far. So to go back and redo an old game is so easy. It's so easy. If you're just going to remaster a game, you're just going to bring it up to the specs so it plays well, and it runs well on a new console, and you're going to make new sounds, and that's not hard to, to recreate. And they cheaped out again, and look, they still made money. <laughs> Originally, instead of the yaks in Bamboo Terrace, a tiger would have been an enemy in the level. Sadly, the main reason it was cut was due to technical reasons. Brian Argaya recalls that the tiger's turning animation looked quite rough and unnatural, because making four-legged characters rotate back in the day on Spyro was very difficult for the team. Luckily, they soon had it figured out with the yak. One of Sunny Villa's early designs features a fountain and a balcony sticking out of the room with the portal to the skateboarding area. It's possible that, because the player can glide over to that section without completing the level first, this would have motivated its removal. It's also been suggested that it may have just been removed to make the first level simpler in design. Areas in games are often entirely removed by developers for similarly small reasons. Sheila's Sunny Villa section also contained a removed Rhinoc enemy that's only ever been seen in a screenshot, and actually in one of the cutscenes in the final game for some reason, Nancy's Icy Peak minigame featured a different enemy as well, with less clothing than the one in the final game. 
There's even a set of animation frames in the game's second demo, which appear to reflect this Rhinox design. Considering that six different demos were released to the public throughout 2000, changes can be seen all throughout. Some things that were changed were as simple as Hunter's skating shorts being red in the demo. There's also larger aspects like early textures and dialogue which were changed. For Sparrow 2, most of the demos included early versions of the music for Sunny Beach and Skelos Badlands, which lack some of the crucial instrumentation in the final versions. This is the exact same case for Year of the Dragon's early footage, with both Bamboo Terrace and Sergeant Bird's themes lacking and even adding some instruments which are missing in the final version. Contacting voice actors was also a priority of ours. Funnily enough, even though the voice actor of Moneybags and Bentley wasn't brought back for the Reignited trilogy, he can still do his voices perfectly to this day. Let's take a look at a quick call we held with him. The way they work these games is each actor works separately. Half the time you don't even know who they are. You come in and there is a, a drawing or maybe two or three drawings of the character and then there is maybe a one or two paragraph description of the character and as you are absorbing all this uh, you try to think up a voice for the character and then you try to reproduce that voice if you are successful and they like what you're doing you perhaps have a job there was a time in my career not really involving games but more animation where i actually had a little cassette player that i would carry around with me and it had all my characters on, on this one particular tape so just before I went in to do a session, I would sit in my car in the parking lot and listen to that tape a couple of times and make sure I had the voice locked down. Usually they are smart enough, especially if a lot of time has passed since they last worked with you, they'll bring a reference recording and they'll say, would you like to hear a reference on this character? And then you say, yes, absolutely. I remember the name Moneybags. He was a very arrogant character, and that's why I did that flippant thing. Was Billy in the slithy toe, his gyre and gimbal in the wave. All mimsy were the burrow groves, and the momraths out grave. Apparently I was down in here, and I was doing some sort of a cockney accent. I don't know why a yeti would have a cockney accent, but must have made sense to us at the time. But when it comes to games, you work alone. I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll, there'll be a line in the script and I'll say to the director, why am I saying this? And they'll look at me and say, I haven't got a clue. Sort of have to guess. And folks who play these games, play them over and over, and they, the voices get drilled into their brain and they become obsessed with it. But for me, it was just one three or four hour session out of thousands. Now, the only thing I seem to recall is that I, I think I did several sessions for Spyro, but these long periods of time would go by between them to the point where I'd almost forgotten I even did it. And then my agent would call and they would say, well, they need you again. Really? Oh, okay, that's nice. I seem to recall it was a, two people would show up, a fella and a lady. It's kind of wonderful with voiceovers. There's so many different areas. 
And sometimes when one area dries up, the other one becomes very productive. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Biff Tannen Museum, dedicated to Hill Valley's number one citizen and America's greatest living folk hero, the one and only Biff Tannen.